Our guest today is model, writer, and host of The Way We Are podcast, Munro Bergdorf. Munro uses her platform to advocate for inclusivity for all, all races, all abilities, all sexualities, and all gender identities. She's here to share how mental health can be a work in progress and why mental illness doesn't define you. Plus, why rejecting oppression has been key to her flourishing and how feeling stuck in life can be the start of something magical. Welcome, Monroe. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's, it's great to have you here. Thank you. So, I like to kick off with some gratitude. Mm-hmm. So, my question to you is, what are you grateful for today? I'm grateful looking at the news to um, be safe physically, mm. um, but also that we live in a world where I feel we're all slightly, we're all becoming slightly more enlightened to the way that the world works and um, to biases that exist, um, how fragile democracy is and Mm. how important it is that we um, stand up um, and support each other and um, share our stories as well in a human way. Definitely. Yeah. At times like this, you, we can, like you say, become more aware mm-hmm. and actually unite and galvanize around our sort of common challenges as mm. human beings. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's, I just think it's so great that we, you know, with the internet and with um, social media and um, a more connected world that yeah. we're living in, we can share these stories and that, you know, in previous generations, they, they just relied on word of mouth, but, mm. you know, we can physically see it mm. um, now. Um, and um, I think that that's really galvanizing people in on the right side of history. Yeah. And you're obviously playing your part in that. I mean, you're you're an activist. You're raising awareness. I mean, how would you describe yourself and the work that mm. you do? I think increasingly less defining myself as an activist. I think that word comes with a lot of pressure, mm. and I think that it it comes with a lot of excitation as well. Mm. And you end up kind of performing the role of an activist rather than feeling like a human a lot of the time. And um, I, I engage in activism, but I'm less and less describing myself mm. as an activist just because it feels very heavy, especially during these times where, you know, there's so much transphobia um, in a systemic manner um, mm. operating within society. And also racism there's always been um racism so it's um i find it difficult and it does weigh on me emotionally mentally Mm. so i think i'm i'm trying to like see myself as a person who engages in activism rather than defining myself as an activist because it's so it's so absolute sometimes Mm. Mm. yeah that makes that makes sense to me Mm. how would you describe yourself then as a human being as a human being, um, oh God, I mean, multifaceted like yeah. we all are. Um, I have my good and bad days, um, but I think I'm a human being that is dedicated to growth. Mm. And um, I'm always trying to educate myself and expand my worldview and make sure that, you know, my blind spots don't play into a narrative of other people's um, social difficulties. So I just try to be the best person that I can be and, um, you know, admit that I have faults, I have flaws as well as um, great bits as yeah. well, like we all do. So um, I just try to, you know, treat other people how I want to be treated and recognize that if somebody does something that I deem as, you know, not what I would do, then, you know, th- that is kind of just what makes us human beings, that we all yeah. see the world in different ways. And that perspective, that way of seeing the world, has that grown out of your childhood? Were there like clues as to how you would show up as a human being now back then? Mm, uh, not really. Um, I, I definitely had um, my period of like going off the rails as a kid mm. and um, as a young adult as well. I think it was only really towards the, like in my late 20s that I really started to um, 
take my mental health a lot more seriously yeah. and uh, be more aware of the situations that I was putting myself in and the people that I had around me, who was supporting me, uh, was I even supporting myself? Um, so it, I think it was really during my late 20s that I started to do the work sure. and started to um, invest in my mind as well as, you know, physically transitioning. Yeah. So how how do you think about your mental health? So when you use that term, what does mm. it mean to you? Um, for me, my mental, I mean, we've all got mental health. Yeah. And I think that it's interesting in society how a lot of people conflate mental health and mental illness and just use it interchangeably. And, um, you know, we've all got mental health, but we don't all experience mental illness. Um, I, I do experience mental illness. I have um, quite severe PTSD, depression and anxiety, as well as um, gender dysphoria, um, which I don't experience as much now because I've had access to healthcare yeah. that have, that's helped that significantly. Um, but my mental health is definitely a work in progress. It's something, it's like a muscle, you know, you stop paying attention to it and it wastes away or it can, you know, uh, um, it, it just doesn't work effectively. So, um, yeah, I, I definitely just try to keep an eye on it. I have periods of time where I don't need to think about it and I can just get on with my day and, um, you know, just feel like I'm not mentally ill. And then I have days where I'm very aware that I am, you know, navigating mental illness. Yeah. I just need to just, you know, make sure that my healing is um, a constant evolution because mental illness can be too. It doesn't stay the yeah. same forever. Um, and the way that it manifests can change. So, uh, yeah, just a work in progress and um, a constant evolution, really. And um, my mental health grows as I grow and yeah. so does the healing. You said quite a few important things there. Um, first of all, you know, we all have mental health. Um, we all struggle sometimes, but we don't all have mental ill health. So mm -hmm. that's important. Um, but also what, what I took out of that is that you can have a diagnosed uh, mental health condition and you can also experience well-being mm. and degrees of flourishing in your yeah. life. So how does that uh, show up for you in your life? Um, I think a, a great deal of freedom comes with learning how to live with who you are as a person yeah. and understanding that, you know, there's, it's very rare that everybody feels 100% a-okay. And I think, you know, looking out into social media, looking out into the world, people don't always share the, their worst parts. Mm. Their, mm. So it can, when you feel like that, it can feel quite isolating, like you're the only, like you're the only one going through it. Um, so I just try to um, make sure that I'm always communicating how I feel mm. and that I've got people around me that also communicate how they feel so that I don't feel like I'm going um, through it on my own. But also making sure that people are in my life that um, are there during the bad as well as the good yeah. because it, it helps you realise that, you know, it may feel like that, like yeah. that, but like it's, you know with the right people around you, you can, you know, stay closer to the rails. Um, so, yeah, I, I think the euphoria comes with um, learning to sit with myself and understand that, yes, I don't feel great right now, but um, there are highs and lows yeah. and um, it's about managing it. And I get a great amount of satisfaction from managing, um, you know, the way that my brain works. Mm. You say managing, you've mentioned support. Are there particular things that have worked for you in the mm. past and that work for you today? I Yeah, support networks. Yeah. Um, so, you know, keeping friends around you that inspire you, that support you in your interests and, you know, help you feel seen and validated, heard, but also, um, you know, give it to you straight. Mm. You don't want people that are just like blowing steam up your bum. <laughs> uh, it's important that, you you know, you've got real friendships yeah. and that's, you know, not always people that tell you what you want to hear. Yeah. Um, so that, but then also, you know, regularly checking in with my inner child um, and thinking about who I was and what I wanted before the world started telling me what I, who I was mm. and what I wanted. Mm. 
especially, you know, navigating a career in the public eye, you constantly need to check in with actually who you are on a base level because there's so much projection that goes on. So, uh, yeah, I, I think it's... It's, it's rolling with the punches, but it's also, you know, kind of standing up against them and um, just making sure that, you know, you do, you do, I don't let it wash over me. Um, I think it's, it's staying on top of the symptoms before they become, you know, overwhelming. Yeah. So when I start to see myself slip, if I start noticing that the house has gone into disarray, yeah. or if um, I'm not sleeping properly, if I'm acting in a frantic way, if I'm feeling that anxiousness um, with regards to um, the amount of stuff that I need to do during the day, and then that rolls into my private life i need to like recognize that this is happening before it becomes a problem Mm. so i think um in recognizing those signs you get to know yourself in a heightened way yeah and um that gives me a great amount of satisfaction because it's um i feel like i can be on my own team and it's all well and good you know having people to pick you up when you're down but it's it's really it's a satisfying feeling to know that you've got your own back, mm. especially with um, depression and anxiety, which is kind of your mind working against itself. Yeah. When you can trick your mind into being like, you can't get this one through the gaps. Yeah. It's, it's good. It's, I feel, um, I feel stronger um, than, you know, feeling like I'm in a body where my mind is um, trying to, you know, put me in a bad spot mm. these are the kinds of topics um you know growth i see it as as flourishing as as containing the the bad stuff as well as the good stuff mm. you know it's, it's all part of being a human being these seem to be the kinds of topics that you navigate in your podcast mm. am i right yeah and that's the way we are yes so can you just tell us a bit more about the podcast so the way we are is a spotify exclusive and we I basically go on a journey with my guest, um, different well-known guests and um, all very inspirational in their own right, but we go back to their past and then we go to their present and then we go to their future and just Mm. kind of unpick who they are um, on a base level and then how that got them to where they are now and then where they hope to go in the future. Um, We've had everyone from Jade from Little Mix um, to M and EK um, to... um, so the drag race queens mm. um and more recently um natalie manuel's an incredible actress um so just people that have achieved really um incredible things but also acknowledging the adversity within that journey yeah. and that it's not a linear path it's kind of it's all over the place and how their adversity played a significant role in them understanding who they are as people um and yeah that's the way we are yeah I'd like to pick on that, pick up on that in a bit, the adversity piece mm. and it's the role that it plays in our growth. Yeah. But first of all, I want to ask you, I mean, you've had amazing guests and one of my favorite bands when I was younger was Skunk and Nancy and I see yeah. you, had, you had skin. So that one was, of my favorite guests. That was amazing. Yeah. So on that note, who has, and I'm sure you love them all and they've, they're probably uh-huh. all inspiring <laughs> in different ways. Favorite. I am going no. to. <laughs> um, probably skin, just because <clears throat> really? she... Um, played such a huge role in my childhood in helping me understand who I was and and recognizing that you know difference is beauty yeah. and it's resilience and it's um groundbreaking and all of the things that all of the opposite of the things that I was told it was when I was growing up you know y- you weren't encouraged to be different I wasn't encouraged to be different yeah. when I was a kid um so sh- to see her succeed and just just this magical human being on television when I was a kid and then getting to talk to them um, when I'm an adult and, you know, getting to thank her as well um, and let her know, you know, the the huge impact that she had on me was um, really, really important to me. But I mean, I don't necessarily have like a favourite guest Mm. because everybody's journeys are so different. Um, But that was a great moment for me personally. Amazing. All of the episodes are great. You should binge them all. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So to come back to that adversity and its relationship to growth mm. and flourishing. I guess in your own life, you know, what role has adversity played in your capacity now to show mm. up the way that you do? 
Well, I mean, unfortunately, it's played a massive role. And I Mm. say unfortunately, because adversity is very much always on other people's terms. So, I mean, I would love to have had um, more of an active role in my life rather than having to navigate other people's um, bigotry and um, ignorance. Um, But, I mean, that is the world that we live in, unfortunately, as a marginalised person. Um, You know, we're, we're taught black history from the perspective of it starting with, you know, slavery (laughs) and if anything that's more white history than it is black history because you know black people existed before that but that was something that was done to us yeah so very much the same with you know being queer or being trans or uh being a woman so much of our identity is wrapped up in how we are treated with people that have more privilege than us so um Having the words to describe that is something that has been so powerful for me. Mm. In having the language to describe misogyny, the language to describe transphobia, and to foot it within society to understand how it functions, and to have the words to describe it, the words to identify it, definitely help take some of its power away. Um, But yeah, I think all marginalised communities, uh, marginalised communities are built often in resistance to the things that um, want to stop us from flourishing. Mm. Um, So in my resistance, I have definitely found my joy. Um, I have, in in the rejection of um, oppression, I've been able to flourish. Mm. Um, I think it's acknowledging it is identifying it acknowledging it and letting it go um because i used to care so much about what um you know racist people thought about my skin i used to care so much about what transphobic people thought about my gender identity what misogynists thought about my womanhood Mm. and you can't control that all you can do is control how you respond and um, understand what it means for them because yeah. it's a them problem, it's yeah. not a you problem. And this is pro- probably a, a big question that requires a, a big answer, but I'm sure you've thought about it. Like, why do you think human <clears throat> beings are typically fearful of people that are different to themselves? Like, what underpins that, do you think? Um, I think it's fear of the unknown, um, but also I think it's fear of self. Mm. Um, I was talking, um, I went to a dinner last night with Gamma Magazine and I was talking to the editor-in-chief and we're talking about phobia, um, so homophobia or like misogyny. And, you know, we we talk a lot about fear. Um, So like fear of gay people but gay people are constantly being beaten up mm, mm. there's there's not a level of threat there fear of trans people but trans people are the ones being murdered um at disproportionate numbers so it's not a physical mm-hmm. fear so what is it it's i i think it's a fear of how marginalized people make people with privilege Mm -hmm. It's like racism back in the day, you know, with um, lynchings and stuff. It wasn't a physical fear. It was a fear of the unknown. And that unknown is a fear of self. Mm -hmm. Um, So I, um, you know, when people are transphobic to me, I'm like, well, where is this coming from for you? Because I know exactly who I am. But you're the one that has the problem understanding the fact that there's more than two genders in the world. Mm -hmm. Um, Even if you don't think they are, there are, and there has been forever. Um, So it's, you know, I think a great deal of sympathy comes now that I feel I'm a fully realized healed person, healing person, Um, but I'm definitely healed insofar as my gender identity. I don't feel like I need to conform um, in the same ways that I used to. I don't feel like I need to, um, you know, double down on, you know, people trying to um, demand questions of me. Um, I think it's... I think it's sad when people can't accept people that are different to them. Mm. And I think it's very telling about what they think about themselves. It's just, you know, the bully mentality, bully people, like people that are happy with themselves do not bully people. And people that understand who they are, don't berate other people Mm -hmm. for not understanding who they are as well. And that's the reality. And that seems to really play out in social media. So what's clearly apparent is that it's not an inclusive world on social media. Um, and social media seems to be 
a place where a lot of young people that that almost is their world to a degree, and that's that's obviously a an, mm. an, an overstatement. But you know, people spend a lot of time on social mm. media. They learn from social media. They engage. They express, etc. Mm. Um, and then just, just to see people's comments, it's like you know, mm -hmm. there's a lot of hate, a lot of bigotry, like you say. I, I'm curious to know, like, the first obvious response is anger. Do you ever feel like compassion? For those people, given mm. what you've just said now, because it clearly is a sign of things not being right inside for them. Mm. I mean, do you, do you ever feel? Do you ever? Are, are you able to access compassion, or is, it, is that one step compassion too far? Compassion as a demographic, I think, is yeah. pretty pathetic <clears throat> to you know berate people that you don't know online because there's such little repercussions for yeah. it. So I think it's pretty sad. I do feel it in that way. Yeah, I don't feel like a compassion is let's hang out. No, but no. I feel like it's like it's pretty sad mm. to um you know be sat there on a keyboard and to be taking out your hatred on people that you don't know. That's a sad state of affairs. Yeah for them um but um yeah i think social media uh has we've got so we've got so far to go with it mm. and it's it's kind of it's scary to think that the younger generations don't know of a world without it mm. um so you know my generation didn't grow up with um you know barely the internet well i mean we grew up with the internet but it wasn't in the same yeah. capacity as yeah. it is now so you know i didn't have to deal with um you know online hatred at, at school um at home as well you know i mean i dealt with it at school but yeah. when i went home it, it stopped um so i i i think i want the younger generations to think about a world without social media mm. like who are you mm. beyond it yeah because there's so much pressure that comes with it and it can be a great space but it it can also not be mm. and the pressures that come with it and you know the, the pressures to just keep up the pressure to say something at the right time quickly yeah with everything that's happening in the world um to be aware of everything that's happening in the world to constantly be plugged into your mm. news stream to then check in with friends to be putting across the right image um it's a lot um, so I definitely, you know, I, I dream of a world where social media doesn't have as much as an, imp as mm. an impact. I think it, it's impossible. It's important that we have it, but I don't think it should have the gravitas that it has sure. right now. Because I feel like a lot of people are losing themselves and a lot of people are losing themselves in a way where they're not actually realizing that they're lost, which is them manifesting itself in um, our behaviors, mm -hmm. which can ultimately result in negativity as well and i think i suspect that that's um a reason why there's so much trolling as well as you know anxiety and depression and body dysmorphia and all of this stuff um so you know i think that we need to be giving social media a lot less clout mm. than um it's currently receiving and have you changed your relationship with social media over the years in any yeah way? yeah i mean i upload um, but I mean, the the weight that I put on it is significantly less. I I'm not checking how many people are liking my posts. I'm mm. not thinking about you know when when should I post this as much. Um, I'm not you know investing as much as I used to in it because it's just a, it's such a fruitless pursuit. It's like why seek out the validation of strangers when I mm. could be pouring into um, relationships where people can actually receive that, um, where I can, you know, of course you can do both, but I feel like it's such an absolutist platform and it's addictive. That's, yeah. you know, it's, it's built to be addictive. Um, so, you know, those moments in bed where I could be, you know, reading or I could be, um, you know, get, getting an hour's extra sleep or like falling asleep quicker. Um, I'm just much more mindful about how I'm passively consuming yeah. and um, what I'm passively consuming, how my data is being used, um, you know, w how I feel when I put my phone down. Um, and also, you know, the messaging that I'm putting across as well. Um, I'm just trying to get people to think a little bit deeper than um, just accepting, you know, what social media presents with them. Yeah. You presents them with. 
Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you mentioned there about people are losing themselves in social media. So like, I guess the opposite of that is finding yourself. Mm. And it seems like a lot of your work, the things you're doing centers around that, like mm. finding yourself, owning yourself, expressing mm. yourself in the world and co-creating a world that mm. uh, invites people to do that, not not the opposite. Yeah. Yeah, and I think social media can definitely mm. help you find yourself. It's just a very slippery slope. Mm. So if you're not, if you're active about your consumption, I think it can definitely help you find yourself. Sure. It can help you find your people. It can um, provide visibility for you to recognize, um, you know, parts of yourself and other people. Um, but then also if you're a vulnerable person that's trying to find themselves yeah. you can end up in pockets of the internet that can easily help you lose yourself yeah and you know th that's where like radicalization happens that's where misinformation spreads that's where you know um you can go into uh like pockets of the internet that are extremely damaging with bodily body image mm. so um it's i think it's being just aware of how the internet functions not completely rejecting it not completely rejecting social media just being aware of um, the potential of um, it not being a positive place for you. And you may yeah. not see it happening. So, um, yeah, just to be active with that sure. understanding. Sure. Yeah, awareness, proactive, active, not giving your power away to it, but like mm. having some sense of power over it yeah. seems important. And understanding, you know, how data works, yeah. how, um, you know, the algorithms work, how mm. the algorithms function, how they're written. Um, this machine learning uh, that's written by human beings so that in itself holds intrinsic bias mm -hmm. um, that then exacerbates other problems within society so I think it's just very um, you know it's very important that we're mindful of that that social media is as much a reflection of society as is a magnifying glass and mm. it can um, make problems a lot worse if we're not all careful about how we're using it yeah, I agree. To come back to the idea of owning yourself, expressing yourself in the world, mm. um, you've written a book, which I know is coming out next, next year. year. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's transitional. Yeah. How to live an authentic life. Yes, yes. Tell us more about that. Um, so the main crux of the book is that we all transition in one way or another. Mm. And gender transition is just one of those, um, you know, uh, experiences of growth and change. Um, but from sexuality to adolescence, love and relationships, um, race, we all have... Um, and healing and purpose. We all have a journey um, that is... Um, that begins at say A, goes to B, goes mm. to C. It's like a never ending, um, a never ending experience. And I just want people to think of, you know, themselves as in transition, that, you know, none of us stay the same forever. We're all um, going through a process of becoming. Mm. And mm. Um, being transgender is just one way that we become. And, you know, it starts with adolescence, and that's our first transition going from ch um, childhood to adulthood. Sexuality, we don't, you know, a lot of us were raised under the pretense that, you know, sexuality is only, you know, someone's asked their sexuality, um, they were m more likely to say normal. Mm. Um, but we've come so far within society that you know less people are like kind of really identifying with rigid sexuality as much as they used to especially younger generations mm -hmm. there's the um lowest um fraction of lowest percentage of heterosexual people ever um with more and more young people identifying as queer so um yeah it's just talking about um how society changes mm -hmm. how we change within that and um, then the internal change as well that goes within that. So, so who would you like to read the book? I'm guessing I you'd think say everyone, everyone yeah. can get something out of it. Um, I mean, I would love everyone to read it, obviously. Yeah. But, um, you know, I think anybody that um, is feeling... Uh, that feels... that is feeling stuck. Hmm. Um, and also people that are struggling with change. 
So I think those two extremes of, you know, either feeling like you're not changing enough or like you're changing and you're you're finding it difficult to yeah. deal with it. I think that those two people can find great solace in this book because um, it's a real champion of change and how it's also a champion of understanding that when you feel stuck, that that's when you're on the cusp. Mm. That's when you're like, when things are about to change. And it's usually when I feel stuck that I'm like, okay, well, this is a great foundation for me to build upon because I am acknowledging that something isn't right. I'm acknowledging that I don't feel comfortable in this stagnation. So how am I going to build upon that? And um, it can, I think it's just changing how you think and how you look at situations. Yeah. So it is very much a memoir, but um, there's sociological um, aspects to it. And also, you know, looking at big changes within society, like feminist movements and, um, you know, um, civil rights movements and um, how we talk about things um, is such an important point in how we move things forward. Mm. I mean, it, it sounds like it can and should apply to everyone. You know, if you consider that life is about change and movement mm. and stagnation is, let's call it death. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, fluidity versus rigidity and spectrums versus binary thinking and ways of seeing things, mm -hmm. th those are relevant to everyone and mm -hmm. everyone's lives. Mm -hmm to different degrees. Yeah, and I think it's also like a it's it's a great it offers a great deal of hope to people that are being persecuted on the basis of their difference mm -hmm. or on the basis of that people don't understand them because it's new information even though a lot of the time it's not it's just repressed information or suppressed or um, or oppressed um information. Um so, you know, the idea that, you know, stagnation is death um, is one of comfort because, you know, people that refuse change um, doesn't mean that change isn't going to happen. It, if there's one constant in the world, it is change. Um, so you can either be part of that and embrace other people's change or you can resist it and sure. then, you know, stagnate and die out. And how have you stayed firm or strong in your identity? I know that, again, that's fluid and change, but in your, like, maybe your deepest identity as a human being amongst all of the misunderstanding and misrepresentation like how are there ways that you stay strong and firm with that with who you are um <clears throat> no i mean i haven't always strong um stood okay. strong and firm unfortunately um and i had um a great deal of difficulty finding my core hmm. um when you know i mean i i think for a long time i didn't deal with it i just kind of just pretended that it wasn't happening and just put it into a box and just kept putting it into the box but you know you can only put so much into the box before it just like opens and everything comes out again and that's kind of what I was dealing with and then I burnt out and um, had severe PTSD mm. from a lot of the things that I went through um, in the public eye and um, I think it's also acknowledging that you don't need to be strong and firm sure and um, I always felt like I had to be. And that's why I was putting it in the box because I mm. had to have my my stuff together. Um, and I didn't feel like I had the time or the energy or the will to interrogate how I actually felt. Mm. Um, so I pretended that I was okay and pretended that, you know, it wasn't happening, pretended that you know, because I acknowledged what happened. Um, I thought that that was dealing with it, but it wasn't. Um, so I think the real test of strength has been not putting it in the box mm. and deciding to confront how I feel, it, the discomfort that I felt and the, the sadness that I felt and face it head on. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but in doing that, acknowledging that I'm not okay sure. and that um, I wasn't okay and I, I probably won't be okay for a while until um, it's 100%, you know, um, you know, until I've got over that hill. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I think there's such a pressure to be strong and be okay yeah. and all of that kind of stuff. And um, I don't think any of us are really that strong or that okay. And I think it's just part of being a human being. Definitely. You know, we all have those moments where, you know, everyone's gone and it's just us. And, you know, how do we sit with ourselves? And some people can more than others. And um, but we all have that moment where it all becomes a bit too much. Mm. And I think it's good to acknowledge that.
Definitely. And I, I, as a human being, we have a tendency to want to hide away, push away, block uh, difficult mm. feelings and, and thoughts. And like you've just said now, often the most self-compassionate way to approach it is actually confront them, go deep into them. And I think mm -hmm. that's it's, it's very relevant for us right now, given what's happening in the world. Mm -hmm. Like it could be easy for us to pacify and just uh, distract. But yeah. I think we really need to feel into these emotions yeah. to be able to respond mm. the way we meant to respond mm. especially in like our culture um it's only been very recently that we even talk about mental health mm. i um when i first started this um career that i have um you if you struggled with mental illness or depression or you took antidepressants it wasn't something that you talked about because yeah there was a fear that people would see you as weak or see you as unemployable or a liability or all of these things. Mm -hmm. And it's been so freeing being able to talk about it. And also, you know, you start to realize, oh, actually, a lot of people are on SSRIs. A lot of people have um, diagnosed mental illnesses and it they still are, you know, highly functioning. Yeah. Not that you need to be highly functioning, yeah. but I mean, the, the idea that if you've got mental illness that you can't be highly functioning yeah. or that you can't, you know, be busy and uh, successful and talented, all of these things that um, come with, um, you know, um, uh, misinformation around mental illness. Um, I don't think of myself as, um, you know, I don't carry around my mental illness like I used to mm -hmm. because I don't feel as isolated in it. I know that I can talk to people about it and I can, um, you know, lessen the load. I don't need to go through it alone. Yeah. Um, and anybody that's listening to this that feels alone in it, you know, this, you, you'll you feel so much better if you talk to somebody about it or if you find um, other people that are um, navigating the same thing. I remember when I first, when I, when I was... 19 and I first started taking um, SSRIs and I had so much shame mm -hmm. um, around that time and I met a friend who was also taking it and it just instantly made me feel better yeah. it made me feel like I wasn't doing something that um, made me weak or made me whatever it's, it's just so much easier when you can share your feelings and Definitely. experiences yeah I mean talking about these things openly helps to break down that stigma like you said helps to normalize mm. difficulties that, that we all experience I believe there's also another aspect to this in terms of how we can break this down further and, and make it a far more inclusive mm. thing and that's almost like re and you mentioned this at the beginning rethinking mental health as not just a set of symptoms mm. or problem but also it's it's you know the, mm. the most beautiful thing that we have it's it's how we show up in the world and mm. it includes all the difficult you know ugly bad difficult stuff mm. but also the, the you know the things that help us to connect with each other and mm -hmm. bring our best selves into the world so like almost like celebrating mental health yeah i think so i think that there's a there's a lot to be said about you know actively um creating an environment that fosters good mental health yeah. like you yeah. know exercising empathy compassion kindness mm. happiness and um you know making sure that um, cultures and environments are positive yeah. um, rather than you know just picking up the pieces when it all falls apart I think again it's you know making sure that you incre that you're creating an environment where people can flourish yeah and um, I'm so glad that we're having that conversation and um, that you know work cultures um, you know and toxic work cultures um, are um, being um, interrogated like they ha have never been mm -hmm, before. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I think it's, yeah, exactly. It's about making sure that we are, um, you know, each other's keeper as well. Yeah. That, you know, you're navigating the world and creating it in the way that you would want to live in it. Yeah, I'm really glad you said that. I, I think the question needs to shift from, you know, how do we address the problems that our cultures are creating to how can we create cultures that foster mm -hmm. flourishing yeah and it's a big shift and mm -hmm. it'll it'll inspire different behaviors and ways of of yeah. relating to each other and so on yeah for sure i think it's about you know build like just creating the world as you want it and then the problems won't yeah be there sure. there's no point in just 
continuously creating the problems. Yeah. The way that this world works, I just don't understand it sometimes. <laughs> and so part of that is obviously creating an inclusive culture. Mm -hmm. And I have a question here I'd like to hear your answer to. And I recognize that in asking it, I am, you know, I'm a, I'm a white um, heterosexual male. Mm -hmm. So I recognize what that comes with. But the question is to create an inclusive, a truly inclusive culture. And this might be an ideal that is maybe a long way off, but mm -hmm. does that ultimately mean transcending things like identifying ourselves by our sexuality, our mm -hmm. race, our ethnicity, mm -hmm. etc.? Or not? Like, is, is it? I guess it's it's probably a both and. We mm -hmm. can honor those things and transcend them. I just wonder what your. I think it's really important. That. I don't think that we can transcend them until society yeah. transcends them. Um, so I think the most important thing is equity. Mm. Um, if we are going along the line of equality, of course, equality is the goal. But if you're giving people that have less the same amount as you're giving people that have more, then that. Yeah places are still at a yeah. deficit so um equity is how we get there certain communities need more resources um and um if we are hoping to build um something that resembles equality yeah then um we need to make sure that we are pumping resources pumping um opportunity into communities that for decades if not you know hundreds of years mm -hmm. have been a place at a disadvantage um so i think it's yeah it's that but also i think it is acknowledging i think it's important to acknowledge when necessary um not necess it's not always necessary um and it's not always necessary that marginalized people need to be put in the position where they're expected to do that also. Sure. So I think it's really about, you know, reading the room. Um, how is this playing into a narrative of equality and how can we equitably support communities that for hundreds of years have been disenfranchised? Mm -hmm. So obviously you are, I mean, I don't know if this is the right word, you're passionate about this. So this is your purpose. Mm. Um, it, you live a purpose-driven life, it would seem. Like, how important has this purpose been for you? It's been really important. Um, but at the same time, I'm writing about this in the book, and I think that sometimes your, um, your perceived purpose can become so entangled into your identity mm. that you can lose sight of yourself sometimes, mm. especially when, you know, your purpose is wrapped around the concept of fighting yeah um and you can become quite burnt out um and i definitely burn out yeah. and you can lose sight of who you are at one at any given time mm. um and i've been doing this job for um a long time and when you're talking about the same thing all the time yeah. you yeah. can start to feel like you're living in the past a little bit and then all of a sudden you're like well who who am i at this point because i know mm. that i'm talking about my past experiences but i've been doing that for so long that i'm now not really sure about who i am you forget to live sometimes so i'm making sure that i'm living outside of my social purpose yeah and thinking a lot more about my personal purpose and like, what do I want for myself? What what would make me happy if all of this went away? Because, mm. you know, I'm very aware that this is my career as well. And um, there's a thin line between purpose and workaholic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I'm just trying to like live purposely as well as act purposefully mm -hmm. and um, recognize that this is my job, but there needs to be other stuff outside of that. Like, what are my interests? What? you know am i funneling enough into you know experiencing like things like love and um you know do, what do i want in terms of a family yeah it's really insightful and, and it seems like a wise way of approaching this you don't want to become totally wrapped up in this purpose and like you said before like your identity isn't just activism you're a human being with mm multifaceted parts of who you are yeah. and you express that in the world mm -hmm. I think that we're all kind of forced to present ourselves in 2D and we're all like kind of just like becoming mini brands and it's, mm. it's, it's it feels a little soulless to me I feel like you know you lose the richness of a human being um, when you do that 
mm-hmm. and we will become become either either like our worst moments or our best moments, and then people want to tear us down from the top, and it's it's exhausting. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I I I just I wanna I wanna live, and I think yeah. that that really needs to take place off of social media as much as mm-hmm. possible. So do you do you have a, a vision for your life, or do you just want to live and let life unfold for you? Like, or do you have is, is both. it both and? Yeah. yeah. What what is your vision for your life? My vision for my life, I mean, obviously, just you know, happiness. Um, that's the main driving force for me. Um, I, you know, I mean, very simple pleasures. To be honest, I just want like a big house. Mm. Um, you know, lots of kids, lots of animals to um, have a career that is fulfilling, um, but to not, you know, exist for it. I want to feel like I made my stamp on the world, um, that I inspired other people to be happy and be themselves. Um, I just, I never want to stop enjoying life. And I think that's something that, you know, mental illness has taught me is, you know, how how bad it feels to not enjoy being alive mm-hmm. and to um how how scary it is to not be in control of your own mind so i think those two things are, are things that are really important to me to make sure that you know i'm enjoying being here yeah and to um you know make sure that i'm in the driver's seat that i don't allow um an illness to dictate how much i live I would think that that's what, probably what everyone wants for their life, right? Mm. Yeah. So we, we we're nearing the end, but I I get a, I guess I have a question. I mean, there, there's there's lots of stuff to be concerned about, obviously. But mm-hmm. are there things in your life right now, or are there people in your life right now that are cause for hope mm. and inspiration for you? Like, what what brings you the most hope for the future? Um. I'm I'm so lucky to have so many amazing people in my life. I I have an incredible boyfriend, and um, he brings me a lot of happiness. Just um, to be in it, like as I've I've had like abusive relationships in the past, and um, I think it's 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 lovely when somebody teaches you how you deserve to be loved, mm. and experiencing that has been a very welcome um a very welcome romance so it's, it's been lovely um so yeah him and um just my friends i i'm very very selective about who i'm friends with because i think you know you become the people that you surround yourselves with in one way or another um not that we're all you know um responsible for each other's actions but i think ultimately you do end up um, becoming mirrors of each other if you surround yourself with a certain kind of energy. Um, so yeah, I, I I love my friends and the support that we offer each other and the encouragement and the understanding um, in the good times and the bad and um, just allow each other to be without the pressure of having to conform to who we should be in the, you know, there's nothing worse than a a relationship which is in competition Mm -hmm. with each other. Mm -hmm. There's no competition. It's all about just meeting each other where we're we're at rather than the expectations of where we should be. Um, So yeah, just, I've, taken a lot of time and energy thinking about who's in my life yeah. and I was actually single for like four years before I met my boyfriend okay. so um, I'm very very um, conscious about the importance of having good relationships that sounds great thank you so you've shared so much that I think is relevant and resonant for most people mm-hmm. um, but is there any final thing you want to say or share like before we before I say goodbye when it comes to mental illness, I think that the the worst thing that you can feel is ashamed. Mm. Shame is such a killer of joy. It's a killer of action. It's a killer of, um, you know, progress. So I think 
the only thing that I can really recommend is doing anything that you can to, um, you know, feel proud of who you are. You know, mental illness doesn't define you. And for so long, I felt, you know, all consumed by this part of myself that I was massively ashamed of. And um, you, there's no reason to feel ashamed. Um, and you'll, you'll actually, if you start talking about it with other people, you'll realize how many um, of the patterns that you think are unique to you are actually actually a shared experience across the world and um, when you start talking to other people that experience that as well you can figure out ways to better deal with it and um, it's about managing rather than um, you know completely rejecting or living yeah. in shame and silence it's about you know being vocal and um, talking to other people that experience the same thing so you can manage so you can live with rather than um, live a, a double life and um, yeah I think that that's the only thing that I can advise just talk sure. keep talking so Monroe thanks for sharing your what's on your mind what's on your heart today I've really enjoyed uh, speaking thanks with you thanks for having me yeah. thank, thank you, you. Thanks for listening. We'll be back next week with another episode and another brilliant guest. Flourish is a podcast from Unmind, a mental health platform transforming the world of workplace well-being. To find out more, visit unmind.com or follow us on socials at unmindhq. You can also find me, your host, on Instagram at steve at unmind. See you next time.